Welcome to Season 3 of Purposeful Empathy. My name is Anita Novak, and this show is all about amplifying the voices of people around the globe who believe the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. This episode was brought to you by Grand Here and International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. So welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I'm joined by Dr. Vivek Venkatesh. He is a filmmaker, musician, multimedia artist, curator, and applied learning scientist working at the intersection of public pedagogy and critical digital literacy. He is also the UNESCO Co-Chair in Prevention of Radicalization and Violent Extremism, Director of the Center for the Study of Learning and Performance, and full Professor of Inclusive Practices in Visual Arts in the Department of Art Education in the Faculty of Fine Arts at Concordia University in Montreal. Now, in his spare time, he's also the co-founder of the Grimposium Festival conference series, co-founder of Project Someone, which we will definitely get into, and musical performer with three bands, Landscape of Hate, Landscape of Hope, and Halka. Welcome, Vivek. Hi, Anita. Thanks for having me. Great. Now, in preparation for this uh, conversation, um, I watched a talk that you gave for Walrus, and you shared a very um, compelling and poignant story, and you allowed yourself to really kind of feel what came up for you, and I really appreciated that. Now, at the risk at 9 a.m. in Montreal, kind of like opening up some kind of painful memories, I wonder if you would share with our listeners and viewers today kind of the backstory about your cousin and how that may have influenced some of the work that you're doing today. Uh, Absolutely, I'd be happy to. And and speaking of pain, I've actually just come back from a a very intense physiotherapy session. So obviously it's a different, a different kind of pain to experience, but, uh, but yeah, uh, look, Anita, it's a, it, I think the, the, um, the walrus talk is probably the only time that I've I'd be able to, and I'm not putting it out of the question, but I'd be able to speak about it with, uh, with that kind of clarity. I had to be able to write about it first. And I was quite pleased that uh, for that particular talk, we were expected to deliver a message within the seven minutes that we were allowed. So I knew I had to keep, um, keep a certain pace. Um, but it also felt like the right time to be able to share that story because for me, having to come to terms with my own uh, with my own hateful emotions is something that I've uh, that I've learned to do over time. Uh, and in in the case of Sukumar, I think what 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 actually hurt me the most was uh, was the randomness of the terrorist act that took him, in the sense that this was an innocent person alongside the 328 other people who perished in the Kanishka. Uh, you know, this was an innocent person who had nothing to do with uh, with the political cause uh, that was being magnified by the terrorists, and that, in and of itself, is is really important for uh, uh, at least for, for, from the standpoint of coming to terms with such a horrific act. The 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 aspect that hurt the most was the loss, obviously, and it still stings a lot because Sukumar is very special to me, someone who um, who I looked up to as an as an older cousin, but someone who also treated me as an equal. And uh, in the Indian culture where uh, where I was born and where a very large part of my family still lives, the um, the hierarchies uh, that that are played out within family structures, within society, within social class. Uh, the uh, the rampant xenophobia between different religions and even different castes is something that lurks as a shadow in uh, at least for, from my own experiences of upbringing. But Sukumar was someone who sort of taught me to be very very even keeled, and um, uh, he he was someone with whom I could express uh, my uh, my emotions, whether they were you know just banal to uh, to excitement to sadness. And so, just losing that person in my life was particularly uh, was particularly hard. But then to to experience the hate that I felt towards the people who committed that act, uh, and to uh, to not be able to come to terms with the fact that 
uh, you know, as a as a as a young humanist, and I knew then itself that I that I was a humanist. Uh, but as a young humanist, that I I felt good about hating, and I felt mm-hmm. good about feeling that uh, that emotion of othering, and I felt it felt good to put down someone who I felt had unjustly taken uh, Sukumar away from me. And it's only it's only years later, and it's only after experiencing othering myself and experiencing marginalization myself uh, after having lived in Southeast Asia for 10 years that I, I found that it was important to come to terms with, with, the, with that othering, with the hatred that I felt, but also to be able to overcome it and recognize it. So anyway, I guess that's a roundabout way of saying that, you know, an intensely personal experience like losing a loved one to a terrorist act, which, you know, you'd never hope that on someone. But then to think of the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of people who have perished uh, because of terrorism. Um, and each of those people carry a story and each of those people have um, have relatives who, uh, who are impacted by that loss. Uh, and I think that uh, there needs to be a space where we can discuss those kinds of polarizations. So yeah, maybe I'll leave it at that and see what that what that uh, engenders in terms of a conversation. Wow, well that, thank you for sharing all of that. The two things that came up for me was one, I got this sense of like righteous anger. So like, you know, maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. The other thing that came up for me was you must have a, a, a very deep degree of empathy for people who have lost people in that kind of violent way. Yeah, you know, the... It's, it's been interesting to think about empathy as a, I guess, as a psychological construct, which I, 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 have, no, um, I have no expertise in that. But in terms of, of uh, thinking of it as an emotion and finding a way to take on the perspective of another, I think it's, uh, it's helped me become more re- reflexive. It's also helped me to slow down. Uh, it's also helped me to slow down in terms of not entirely rushing to judgment, uh, but not being afraid to judge and then to to provide a logic for that judgment. And I think that uh, in an increasingly narcissistic and in an increasingly accelerationist social media culture, uh, this power of reflection is something that I find I I was missing, and which is why I. I skipped out of social media from a from a personal standpoint, and I wanted to take that step back uh, and uh, be reflect reflexive myself, uh, and find a way to, in fact, think about uh, how being empathetic uh, might might be uh, might be useful uh, for me in terms of growing and in terms of developing. But also how it would uh, it would be important to reify this to actually make it real with the projects that I run as part of my UNESCO chair as part of uh, Project Someone. Um, so, you know, there, there must have been something latent about Sukumar that pushed me to mm-hmm. to create Project Someone to co-found Project Someone with several of my colleagues in 2014, uh, but. As the years have passed, and now we're we're seven years into that project, and it's uh, it's grown in a in a in a very successful way. If you think of markers such as you know the number of people with whom we've conversed and collaborated with across the world, uh, and the people who visit our website, and the and the constant the constant I guess um, um, cooperation and collaboration that we build with communities. But more than that, I think. Uh, Project Someone and the UNESCO Chair are embodying the kind of humanism that is in, uh, that is imperative if we think about empathy as a way forward uh, for uh, for breaking down polarizations. Well, I can't wait to talk about some of the projects that you're doing with Project Someone. But if you'll indulge, like a, a, a little wrap up question about that walrus talk, which we'll include as a link um, in the description below. You mention you use these words, and I really want um, to to give you an opportunity to unpack them because I found them so powerful. You said resilience to hate comes from accepting the other from within ourselves. Could you explain that? <clears throat> yeah, this is uh, thanks for that. That's actually 
uh, one of the, I guess, the key points that I took away from myself. I just want to be clear that, you know, with my, with the walrus talk especially, but with also a lot of the work I engage in, I've never expected the uh, the the perspective that I take to necessarily be adopted by others. I don't expect that others can can experience the same things that I have. And I don't think that that's necessarily important. When I talked about resilience to hate uh, being, uh, being something that can only come from understanding the other within ourselves, I was in fact referring to the acceptance of hate as a very powerful. And I know that some of my colleagues have raised their eyebrows at me, especially those with, with whom I've worked with in projects. Someone, I've described hate as a beautiful emotion. There's an online course that we, that we uh, created in 2018 called From Hate to Hope. And we have a series of interviews with practitioners, with, um, with uh, community service specialists, with mental health specialists, with political scientists and uh, religious scholars. And so we were all interviewed and I spoke about, about hate being a particularly beautiful emotion and something that we shouldn't necessarily suppress. And I think, you know, from a, from a practical standpoint, one drives hateful conduct underground when one tries to suppress it. And there's, you know, discussions to be had around the rights and responsibilities of individuals versus, you know, publishers of this kind of hateful content, whether it's social media or otherwise. But if we can't engage in a reflection of what it is that we're not comfortable with about ourselves and then not make a very concerted decision as to why that impacts the way we treat ourselves, the way we interact with others, the way we project our political and social and cultural values in the communities that we are um, sharing, then I think we're not going to understand the importance of hate. I think suppressing it, denying it, these are the things that in fact lead to its magnification. This is again, a very personal philosophy and uh, the beauty of collaborating and cooperating and working with communities who are marginalized, who are vulnerable, who, um, who are seeking to, to speak out against injustices is that, you know, you're able to converse about how each of these communities, how each of the individuals in these communities, in fact, are negotiating uh, these very powerful emotions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just need to take a minute to just kind of <laughs> allow that to settle. Um, that was, that was, um... That was deep. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, sure. I want to give uh, the viewers and listeners context to Project Someone by actually talking about how it's embedded in social pedagogy. So could you describe what um, social pedagogy is and how it helps to counter the epidemic of othering? And maybe I'll add like a little footnote to that for anybody who's listening, who's unfamiliar with the term othering, if you could also kind of just address that. Sure, sure. I guess with, we can start with othering. I think uh, the, the best way to think of othering is to, uh, to create a distinct, a distinct line, a hard line that demarcates those who don't share the same values, uh, same opinions, same beliefs as your own. Uh, And that othering can take a variety of forms. It could be something that's xenophobic uh, because uh, you may, you may, uh, you may decide that it's important to not, uh, to not have a, an opportunity to, to connect with someone who looks different than you, who believes in a different, uh, in a different God than you do, uh, who comes from a different social class. All of those are examples of xenophobia. But then there's also ways in which uh, we can other because we fundamentally disagree about values, because we fundamentally disagree about political structures, political opinions. Um, In terms of social pedagogy, I like to sort of think of it as a very loose construct. Um, You know, I've made no secret that the the notion of social pedagogy is very much grounded in uh, Paulo Freire's 
pedagogy of the oppressed. And what struck me most in, in reading and in uh, analyzing the work that Paulo Freire and his colleagues have, um, have, have continuously embodied is that they continuously talk about teaching with as opposed to teaching to and learning with. So there's a certain suppression of hierarchies of knowledge. There's a certain suppression of power and patriarchy as it, as it stands. But importantly, there is a commitment to engagement and a commitment to pluralism. So social pedagogy really embodies those elements of engagement and pluralism. I should ask about Project Someone. So um, could you tell us how it started, what the vision was, what some of the projects are, some of the impacts? Um, yeah, I'm really curious to hear about that. Sure. So Project Someone started in 2014, and it stands for Social Media Education Every Day. And so the genesis was really a way for us. Uh, we were a small group of um, of uh, researchers and research professionals in the broad field of education, whether it was concerned with technology, philosophy, um, you know, digital literacy. So we were a small group of us who lobbied the federal government to open up their coffers. Um, at that point in time, they had uh, they had a uh, they had a program called Kanishka, which was named after the plane that uh, that Sukumar died in. And so I'd always, since I always keep track of information around, around that particular terrorist act, I was just interested in the fact that they had named a funding program Kanishka and it was an anti-terrorism, at least that's how counter-terrorism program. So I called, I remember we, I called the program officer and spoke to him about the need for investment in education. And he sort of opened the door saying, yeah, that'd be interesting. Why don't you propose something? And then we went through several rounds of, back and forth. And, uh, and so Project Someone was born out of that initial sort of funding from the federal government to build a multimedia portal. But instead of this being something that just the four or five of us who formed it, myself, uh, Jihan Raba, Catherine Urbaniak, uh, Robert McGray, Tija Thomas, the five of us who brought it together, instead of this being about something that we wanted to embody, we decided let's take the money, split it up equally and invite 10 people. Um, you know, some of those could include ourselves, but let's invite 10 people to think about hate speech, to think about pluralism, and to come up with uh, some curricula or documentaries or um, materials which embody the way they think about, about hate speech and pluralism. And so that's what was the initial sort of impetus for, for Project Someone. And we found that um, our students took to it. We found that the general public took to it. And so uh, I lobbied for more money so that we'd be able to build capacity and reach out to communities. And since then, Project Someone's grown in a, in a really unbelievable way, at least from the way I see it. We now have 19 distinct projects uh, that span music and multimedia collaborations all the way to uh, the program that you were talking about earlier, where Ryan Scribbins, one of the, one of my postdoctoral scholars, former postdoctoral scholars, who's now teaching in Michigan, uh, where he led a study to interview ten former right wing extremists, uh, Canadian right wing extremists. Uh, so we have we have just this gamut of work, which is very interdisciplinary in orientation. I think the one thing to say about Project Someone is that it's very public facing. So even though we have researchers and creators and research practitioners working on the projects. Um, our program manager, Kat Urbaniak, and I are really clear that we have to create something that's engaging to the broader public. So the research articles, the data, you can go and find those. We'll provide links to them. But the front-facing pages for each of the projects have interviews with our, our, um, our project creators, uh, materials for the public to, to review. If we're covered by the press, we provide those pieces in there. Uh, but it's generally a way for us to instigate further discussions with them. We are international. In fact, we've seen very, very great international success. We've worked with communities in 13 different countries, Europe, North America, Middle East, North Africa. Uh, yeah, so, you know, 
the, the ways in which we are we are expanding, I think, are extremely organic. We have this new funding that we've just received from the government to expand our work in, and collaborations with indigenous communities, uh, both in Alberta as well as in Quebec. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's a constant process of learning and collaborating with, uh, with communities that wish to share with us and with whom we want to partner. So you've been generous with your time and I want to be cognizant of that. So I have two little questions. Two sure. questions. That's a joke. Um, the first one is I mentioned that you play in a couple of bands and I'm, yeah. you know, these bands are, are you, you've said, are intended uh, to challenge conceptions of hate. Why is this important to you? And then, you know, the add on question, why has music always been such a powerful force for social change? You are a musician. So what do you think about that? Leaving well, time for a next question. There's a final yeah, question. Yeah, sure, sure. I, I will, I will, I, I will try to be brief, I guess. You know, with, with the, with the bands that, um, that you mentioned early on in the introduction. So Landscape of Hate was the first band that I co-founded with, uh, with my friend and colleague, Owen Chapman, who's a, a DJ and a sound scholar. And he, he's a professor at Concordia as well in communication studies. And we founded this with, with one of our colleagues, um, Leticia Trandafir. Uh, who um, who's a uh, who's a musician and a uh, uh, and uh, and so we, when we when we talked about forming landscape of hate, it really was a way for us to create a musical uh, a sound basis for describing how prevalent hate was in our society, and we quickly realized that in doing so, we'd be able to draw from media, audio that were publicly available, sourced through the open internet. We then began to talk with one of my friends, uh, who's a filmmaker, David Hall, and uh, we brought him into the fold quite quickly because we realized that we wouldn't, I don't think we'd be doing ourselves justice without thinking of this as a multimedia extravaganza. So the idea behind Landscape of Hate was to literally hit the audience with a you know, with a, a hundred pound brick of what it means to be exposed to hateful conduct and how numbing it can be. And Dave's a great guy to do that visually for us uh, because he's a real edgy and very thought provoking filmmaker. And so when we, when we had our, our debut show, uh, you know, it, it, it sort of brought about the discomfort we were looking for. But Landscape of Hate really grew very quickly in that sense. And now we have three visual artists. We have eight musicians, um, uh, five musicians and three visual artists. So eight of us on stage uh, and any combo of that that comes together. And we are constantly improvising. So there's very little structure to what we do. We sort of each musician takes about 10 minutes to lead a particular a particular structure and then the others follow. And then there's like a segue into another musician who works in and we follow that person. So it's also representative of the cacophony that you hear on social media. And it was great to, 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 to see the band get launched. We played festivals and we, you know, we played to 5,000 people. Our European debut was to 5,000 people uh, at, uh, at the Bergen international festival in front of the queen of Norway, which was really fantastic. But Owen and I soon realized that what we, what we would also want to do is keep Landscape of Hate as this vehicle for our creation, but also create and maybe perhaps, um, you know, juxtapose the work that we're doing and provide an opportunity for youth, for marginalized and vulnerable youth uh, to, uh, to benefit from such an experience. And that's how we, we created Landscape of Hope. And in Landscape of Hope, essentially what we do is we give up the control, give up the reins of creative control to youth. We work with them. We bring in a lot of these synthesizers and uh, get them to think through sound exercises. We have visual artists who, you know, teach you how to build visuals very, very quickly. Our work is very rapid prototype based. The, it's not sort of like a rock camp where you spend weeks and weeks learning to play an instrument and then perform. It's literally 24 to 48 hours. People come in, you don't have need to have any musical education you you learn about about what it means to be marginalized we talk about that with these groups they all come in with a certain baggage and then we try and reify that in terms of a in terms of a performance and landscape of hope is extremely 
agile. We have created sound walks and visual walks at the Museum of Fine Arts. We performed in a church. We have performed at festivals uh, in Iceland. Uh, we uh, so there's and then at at the university. So we do a lot of very different things. We do have an album. Landscape of Hate has a record, so you can check it out on Spotify. It's very 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 chill. It's a soundtrack. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. So I'm trying to get into a habit with my guests of asking a question at the very end of the interview. And this is not meant to put you on the spot. And if nothing is really alive for you, we'll just let it slide and I'll offer a big thanks. But um, I wonder, since this this um, podcast is called Purposeful Empathy, you know, we all have the capacity to empathize if we're neurotypical um and not sociopaths uh but i think that we have the capacity to empathize on purpose we can leverage our cognitive empathy which is about perspective taking and imagining what someone else's life is like without denying lived experience like you'll never really know right but um you can imagine so i wonder if you have a story where you have felt that someone has engaged or practiced purposeful empathy with you and if you would share it with our audience you know i can, I, I the the only example that really comes to mind is uh, members of my immediate family my my uh my adolescent children and my wife i think that they in a certain sense they embody the the kind of purposeful empathy you're talking about uh, because I've struggled with my mental health quite a bit uh, in the past few years, and uh, and it can be onerous, right, uh, to to share that w- uh, with the family. But I I really look to them as uh, as as pillars of that kind of patience, but also the capacity to listen. Uh, that's something that astounds me. A lot. So it's also taught me, I think the way I think about it is it's taught me also to be much more patient, whereas in the past, I'd be a little bit more instinctive and, uh, and rush to judgment. Uh, it's really through the interactions I've had with my, with my 17 and 15 year old uh, and with my wife that sort of keep those areas grounded. And there is a, there is a very intentional way in which they offer uh, the support, right? Which it's not condescending, it's not patronizing, uh, it's uh, very supportive, but it also it also sort of pushes pushes back against uh, against misjudgments that I might be making, presuppositions that I may have. Uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't ask me to suppress my anger. It doesn't ask me to suppress a negative emotion, you know, I think uh, embo- what, what really embodies the kind of empathy that they express towards me specifically is that they allow me to sort of sit in this unhappy curricular space that I like to sit in. I love to think about dystopias. I write about dystopias a lot in my work. Uh, and, uh, you know, my music creation can also be very, very, very dark. And so that's something that's always encouraged uh, but uh, so, the, so at the same time, they're um, you know when they when they do provide that support and structure towards being empathetic, I find that it's uh, it's it's really really quite um, quite refreshing. So that's that's how I would see it. I think. Well, that's a beautiful way to end our conversation. It was such a rich conversation. Thank you for all the time you've spent with me today. You're doing great work. I uh, p- please put me on your mailing list for when. Um, of your band comes out to play yes. a live performance or one of the bands. Yeah. And um, thank you all for watching and for listening. And we'll see you next time. With purposeful empathy. Thank you. What if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free from your thinking clutter, make that important decision and liberate you from whatever is holding you back. At Grant Huron International, you get to select the coach of your choice anytime from any place. Visit GrantHuronInternational.com to harness the power of on-demand coaching today.